Hello everyone and welcome to this Genomics England webinar which we're running in association with the Marovlitis Trust. More on them in a moment but first let me introduce myself. My name is Vivian Parry, I'm a science writer and broadcaster but more importantly for this webinar I have a part-time role as Head of Public Engagement at Genomics England. And now let me tell you about our subject today. Skin is your largest organ, and it does far more than protect you from the sun or keep your insides, well, inside. For those with the skills to read its subtle language, and we're talking dermatologists here, it can signpost not just diseases of the skin, but genetic conditions whose main impact is actually on other organs of the body. Many of these conditions are diagnosed with whole genome sequencing or gene panels. And one such condition is Bert Hogg Dubé, which brings me back to the Myrovlitis Trust. It's a charity founded nearly 20 years ago to promote research into rare conditions and engage with the public about medical and molecular genetics. They also run the BHD Foundation, which drives research, supports and advocates for the community affected by Bert Hogg Dubé across not just the UK, but the entire world. But BHD isn't the only rare genetic condition whose presence is advertised by the skin. It's why we've called this event the skin, a window into genetic conditions, which we suspect might be a concept that's new to a lot of you. What we're going to do today is first hear a bit more about this from a dermatologist and a pulmonologist, that's a lung doctor, both specialising in rare conditions. Then we're going to hear from someone for whom genetic diagnosis prompted by her skin has been really important and learn a bit more about clinical impact from a dermatologist. And then I hope we're going to hear from all of you. So if you have questions, do please put them in the chat and I'll check out the chat. And I promise that you will all be free at 8 p.m. precisely because I know it's the semi-final of Bake Off tonight. So <laughs> let me introduce our first guest to you. Uh, Professor Neil Ragen is a principal investigator and honorary consultant dermatologist based in Newcastle in England. He undertakes basic research coupled with the delivery of early phase clinical trials in rare disease. He's got a particular interest in inherited skin tumour syndromes. Stefan Marciniak is Professor of Respiratory Science at the University of Cambridge and an honorary consultant respiratory physician at Adam Brooks and Royal Papworth Hospitals. His laboratory research focuses on the role of stress signaling in lung disease. He directs the NHS Rare Disease Collaborative Network in familial pneumothorax. We'll explain all this later, which is his specialist research interest. So Neil, let's start with you. Um, whole genome sequencing, what is it? What are gene panels and what have they got to do with skin? Good evening, everyone, and, and thanks, Vivian, for the opportunity and the Marovlitis Trust to speak today. So to look at our instruction manual or our book of life, um, we've, over a period of years and after the Human Genome Project, been increasingly able to look at our entire genetic sequence. And whole genome sequencing really is the culmination of that technology delivered in a clinical context. In England, we're fortunate um, to have had the 100,000 Genome Project, uh, a flagship project internationally, where we sought to sequence the whole genomes of, of individuals with rare diseases and cancer. And the legacy of that um, massive uh, experiment is this delivery into NHS clinical care of selected panels of genes to look at pieces of DNA linked to certain genetic conditions. And Bert Hogg Dubé is one of those. So uh, what's a gene panel? So what we think... I mean, what uh, am I actually looking at when I see a gene panel? In our context of Bird Hog Dubé, um, we are looking at a selection of four pieces of DNA that we study very closely out of the potential 25,000 that sits in any of our instruction manuals, to use the analogy. And, and a gene panel is a selection <laughs> of pieces of DNA that are relevant to a particular clinical pattern of presentation. And so in this example, if someone were to present with skin tumors on the face, um, we would think about certain conditions for which we knew 
about pieces of DNA that are linked to that. And we would test all four of those pieces of DNA, for example, in this scenario at once. And that's a gene panel. So you're effectively, um, I'm not going to call it guessing, because I know that's not what you clinicians do, but but you you are pretty sure that that's what it is before you do the gene panel. Is that right? So we dermatologists are great phenotypers and to to expand on what does it mean yes yes. and um we recognize patterns of events that happen in human skin and these patterns could be either skin lumps they could be a certain uh, changes in the texture or color of skin they could be located at certain body sites and dermatologists for a long time have recognized that some of these patterns happen again and again and have given them either descriptive or eponymous diagnoses. And really in this genetic era, what I hope we can take forward is the application of a molecular test or a DNA test to really clinch the diagnosis. So you said your phenotypers now, uh, all of those who are listening, for me, that this is the superpower of dermatologists. You never want to be sitting on a train with a dermatologist because no. <laughs> they can look at anybody and they can instantly say what they think they have from really subtle signs. And actually, that's what you that's what's making you think of particular diagnoses, isn't it? These kind of subtle signs that other people might miss. Yeah. And this kind of bears out um, in clinical medicine across all specialties, really, and, and pulmonology is no, no different in some ways, in that we're given data all the time in our clinical practice, and across all of these different patients that we see, the art of clinical medicine is to capture individuals which we think have a particularly uncommon or rare diagnosis, because that clinical stratification could impact on how we look after those patients a bit differently from everyone else. So Stefan, Neil there is talking about rare skin diseases, but actually the skin is often important in the diagnosis of conditions that typically wouldn't be treated by dermatologists. I mean, you are not a dermatologist. No, um, no, exactly. And um, but as uh, uh, as we might touch on, there are lots of rare diseases. There are uh, the the estimate is there are eight thousand rare diseases, and so rare diseases as a group, if they're considered as one disease, is actually quite common. If you go to an, a neonatal intensive care disease um, unit, you'll actually find lots of kids with rare diseases. So it's impossible for every doctor to know every rare disease. It's just physically impossible. But some of us super specialize in a small subset. Um, and what my team specializes in is punctured lungs, pneumothorax. So lungs can just puncture spontaneously. And often in tall, thin young lads, it's of no big deal. But it can often be the presentation of a genetic disorder. And for the relevance for today is that several of these have really characteristic skin changes and it's very easy to overlook those skin changes unless you bump into a dermatologist unless you're thinking about it and Bert Hogg de Bay syndrome which is one of the con con conditions that causes pneumothorax popped lungs to run in a family often but not always goes with some characteristic skin changes so when somebody comes to my clinic with a family history of pneumothoraces, as well as looking at scans and things, what we do is we look very hard at their skin and their hands and their joints to try and put together a syndrome. A syndrome is just a bunch of different features that make one condition. And then it, we can then prioritize the, the conditions we think it might be. So Neil, it used to be that we thought about genetic diseases as being you know the kind of thing like I don't know haemophilia or something uh, something like that and there's been this whole revolution that's taken um diagnosis from genetics just kind of single thing to genomics and the 100,000 genomes project was very instrumental in that so tell us a bit about the, that and where skin diseases are in that so um we were involved and I I want to highlight um, Professor O'Toole here, who will speak in a, in, in a moment uh, to some of this, um, in selecting conditions where we had patients with a particular pattern of clinical presentation or, or phenotype for which we had tested known pieces of DNA and found those to be normal. And, and part of the project across multiple tissues was to look for um, the answers or the explanations for those patients who did not have a 
genetic diagnosis. And really, the project is a success because it leverages uh, numbers of patients across the whole country, um, which, you know, level of scale is required to um, be confident that one might have a signal in the genetic code that actually links to a, a genetic condition. And so for, for that reason, it, it's been instrumental, but also it's informed the formation of these gene panels that we've now got. And so we haven't been guessing, Vivian, we've really used a scientific approach, if I may. You'll to... never forgive me for calling. <laughs> no, <laughs> of course I will. But, but um, um, the scenario of, of developing these panels is one where we've leverage this national level experiment and try to then implement that in NHS care delivery. And really what we want to highlight on, on this webinar this evening is this shift that's happened very quickly um, in the background in clinical medicine. And we really need more awareness about how access to testing and how this can become part of clinical care in skin and in other conditions. So for the 100,000 Genomes Project, it's very much um, people who did not have a diagnosis. So they definitely had something. It was definitely rare, but nobody quite knew what it was. And there were a lot of dermatology patients who came into the 100,000, thanks to uh, Adele, who we'll talk to in a, in a moment uh, in particular. But when these um, people came into the project, how many of them were able to get diagnosis and, and, and what was how important was that genetic information in that diagnosis? So I can speak about a, a patient who had um, skin bumps on their face that was registered um, in the very pilot um, in some of the first samples that were sequenced in, in that project. And, and this patient had um, a story of having skin lumps on the face um, and it was not clear as to why these benign lesions were growing. Um, there were the standard tests that were done and they were all normal. Um, and over a period of time, um, we then found that there was a change in a piece of DNA that was responsible for both these skin lumps, but also a history in the family of a special type of brain tumor linked with this piece of DNA. And because of that finding in this family now, we're able to check to see if this person's um, children and grandchildren have inherited this change such that we can screen for the presence of this particular brain tumor. So the skin truly is a window into a, a range of different conditions and the 100,000 in that example was relevant for that family's um, screening. And the great thing as you were explaining Neil is that once you've done that piece of research and you've got that diagnosis then everyone else who comes into clinical care can have the benefit of that knowledge because the tests, they're constantly being updated all the time. It's not like it used to be where you'd, um, you know, you'd have a finding and it went into you know, deeply serious journals for a time and it didn't ever get into the NHS. This is coming into the NHS very quickly. And, and actually, the um, need to keep on our toes here, as you imply, Vivian, is, is key. And we are fortunate to have the UK test directory updated by experts across all fields of medicine to keep um, lists of pieces of DNA that we analyze up to date. And um, this is a evidence-based review that happens and the lists are updated twice a year. And so we are really um, offering what we think is, is the most up-to-date implementation of that knowledge. But could I invite St Stefan to, to speak a bit about how this plays out in, in lung conditions? Because yes. Bird Hawk Dube has this um, link uh, across those tissues and then also in other organs such as the kidney. Yeah, yeah. so so just to, on the panel and then I'll come to, so the panels, one thing is where the panels com came from in terms of, you know, did, did we guess? That, that one of the great things about the 100,000 Jonas Project wasn't simply the sequencing, it was actually getting the community together and to make these lists. So somebody who would lead, so I led on familial pneumothorax, I came up with a ridiculously long just, um, list of genes, and then sensible people around the community could vote on them. And then eventually we're left, we're left with a list that the whole community is confident with. And that list, that, that panel, that gene panel, it has now been lifted on from the 100,000 genomes and plonked into the Genomics England test directory. So what became our research tool is now 
the genetic test for pneumothorax. And before the 100,000 Genomes Project, there was no test for it. And I can say it is being used, and it's largely picking up a small number of conditions, including burt hogg Bay syndrome. So to burt hogg Bay syndrome, which is the sort of the, one of the dermatological conditions that causes pneumothorax, actually, the, 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 the dermatological diagnosis and the lung, the lung pneumothorax diagnosis are not the most important part of that condition. Our job, so Neil's jobs and my job, is to identify these people because they're at increased risk of kidney cancer, which seems completely off, off piste, but it relates to the genetic defect that they have that causes the skin problems and the lung problems. But fortunately, and it's, it is actually fortunate, the skin problems and the lung problems happen much, much earlier than any chance of kidney cancer generally. So as soon as Neil or I diagnose somebody with burt hogg Bay syndrome, we tend to refer them for annual scans of the kidney, usually MRIs, some places do ultrasounds. And the beauty of that is we will always pick up their, their skin cancers because about 20, 25% of them will get kidney cancer. But we can always pick up their kidney, kidney cancers then when they're small enough to cure. And um, because they, you know, they could grow quite, quite large and then present too late to treat. But if we know that they've got the, the syndrome, we can mm -hmm. intervene early. So this is not purely an academic exercise. This is what we call precision medicine. And that means is where we are, we are changing the care of an individual person based on their genetics. And in the past, would those symptoms have been thought almost to have been two separate things? I mean, that's well, very often, yeah. and to be honest, they still are. And that's one of the purposes of this sort of event is to try and um, is to try and make it clear that when there are conditions that don't add up, you know, when somebody's getting lots of pneumothoraces or they've got some skin tumors, the, the important thing is that there are hubs. So most doctors are great at many more things than I am, but I am quite specialized in a small number because Genomics England have set up these systems like the rare disease collaborative networks, the one of the ones I run, is anybody around the country can refer a slightly unusual case into one of these networks, and then we can quickly home in on the diagnosis. So yeah, if, if you don't test, you'll never find, but you can't test everybody for everything. So you have to realize when something is odd and then refer on to one of those specialist uh, networks. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Now, I understand we're having a bit of a problem with our chat and it may not be appearing. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not quite sure what's going on. But I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to suggest something, which is um, that you email me. Um, <laughs> this is a bit mad, but email me. <laughs> and it's uh, Vivian, which is B-I-V-I-E-N-N-E -N -N -E dot Parry at genomicsengland.co.uk. So Vivian, Vivian, dot parry at genomicsengland.co.uk. I am determined to get your questions by hook or by crook. So let's see uh, how we do. So uh, I said we had some other experts and I'm delighted to introduce them uh, to you. Uh, first, um, you have already heard us mention Professor uh, Adele O'Toole. She's Professor of Molecular Dermatology, so a dermatologist at Queen Mary University of London. And she's very active in research on rare skin disease in both laboratory and clinical trials. She was an incredibly important part of the 100,000 Genome Projects uh, Project because she recruited so many dermatology patients. And her special interests are ichthyosis and Pachyonchia. God, I hope I've said that right, Adele. <laughs> but the, uh, the other uh, person who is so important to this uh, webinar is our patient, and that is Carol Cox, who was diagnosed with Bert Hogg Dubé syndrome in April 2022, and not long after her sister was diagnosed with the same disorder. So, uh, Carol, hello. How very lovely to have you with us. No, good evening. So tell me, you said that your sister was uh, ill. Um, did you, at what point did you know that BHD was what she had? And did your testing come because of her diagnosis? Yes. Uh, yes, that's how I had my testing. She had a kidney removed as a child because it was um, diseased. And then she 
had a rare kidney cancer and was operated on in Oxford um, a year last July. The consultant at the time um, told her he was puzzled by the number of specks that were appearing on the scans or x-rays and they couldn't understand what they were. They actually thought she had four tumours, but by the time they operated, she had seven. So she just has 44% of that kidney left now. Um, her biopsies were sent for analysis. And in the October, she went to see them in Oxford and it was suggested that she might have Bert Hogdu Bay, which of course she hadn't heard of. She then telephoned me and told me that she thought I might have it, something I thought was ludicrous at the time. I asked why, and she said, because you had a pneumothorax in your 20s. Ah, ah. Mm. So, yes. And, and of course, you know, pneumothorax, there are lots of other reasons, pneumothorax mm. assigned, uh, rare disease. So, uh, and as they say, if, you, if, if doctors hear, yeah. Uh, hooves outside the window they think yeah. horses galloping they don't necessarily think of zebras galloping but so you had this rare disease and you then had genetic testing That's and right. tell me about that um by the time I got the test results I knew in myself that I had it I knew immediately upon my sister's description that my father had had it because of the skin lumps he had down the side of his face and his neck. And he actually died early of cancer at the age of 60. Even though I knew I had it, it was still upsetting to be told to get a phone call to say I had it. Because after all, I didn't get a call telling me I'd won the polls. The confirmation of having it though, did it explained my facial bumps and blisters and of course the spontaneous pneumothorax that I'd suffered in my 20s. And at that time, I was in hospital for at least seven weeks. I was really quite ill with that then because it was quite rare having a spontaneous pneumothorax. So now, presumably you have this, di this genetic diagnosis. Mm -hmm. It means that all of your family, your extended family can also have testing. Yes. the best news that I had was that neither of my sons have it, which as a consequence means that my two grandchildren don't have it. Um, some members of the family choose not to know. Um, so far, others that have been tested are so far negative, although we have a worry about one cousin, um, but he's, he's fit and well, but he does have some facial bumps that we worry about. And he will get tested, I believe, but he's not had time. So genetic testing has <laughs> been really, really important uh, for your family. Uh, Adele, can I come to you now? Because uh, you see not particularly patients with uh, BHD, but you see a huge variety of patients with uh, genetic causes for their uh, skin conditions. And mm -hmm. is this uh, pattern that um, Carol has talked about of being able to do cascade testing as it's called um, mm -hmm. through the wider family is something that you see very typically. Yeah so so having a genetic diagnosis is very important. Uh, firstly it gives you a, a sort of a tribe that you belong to. You have a definite diagnosis um, instead of sort of being in the dark as to what's wrong with you you now know that this is the diagnosis. And it can have major implications. So for example, if you want to participate in a trial, you have to have a genetic diagnosis. So let's say there was a trial for some rare type of keratoderma. So I'm interested in uh, painful keratodermas that affect the, the hands and feet. And dad has a mutation report, but his daughter has not. Only dad will be able to participate in the trial if a trial became available. So that's why it's important for other family members uh, to also have um, genetic testing. Um, a further reason is sometimes getting a genetic diagnosis may mean a treatment is available to you. Uh, so, for example, I have a patient who's got something called uh, Almstead um, syndrome, which is a very severe, painful uh, keratoderma so the man could hardly walk 
And once he had a genetic diagnosis, we were able to treat him with the drug called erlotinib, which is normally used for cancer, but in at a low dose can be used for uh, this particular type of uh, keratoderma. And finally, in, in, in Carl's case, you know, uh, and in uh, some other diseases as well, if you have a genetic diagnosis, then you may need a cancer screening. And although cancer screening may sound scary, um, getting a diagnosis of cancer early is much better than getting a diagnosis late. So it really, really matters. Now, so we really were talking matters, earlier yeah. about the kind of things that come into uh, dermatologists that are kind of windows to something else. Have you got any examples of the kind of things that you might see as a dermatologist that you think, oh, I think this is something else altogether? Yeah, so there's a couple of uh, good examples. Uh, one is um, a pamoplantar keratoderma associated with uh, woolly or very, very curly hair. And quite often in these families, the person affected, you know, the hair is obviously not the same as other family members. And th this can be associated with a disorder affecting the heart called cardiomyopathy. Um, so that means that the uh, heart uh, muscle uh, sort of overgrows and doesn't function as well as normal. And in the teenage years, if this isn't picked up, uh, those uh, teenagers can get a very fast heartbeat and die. So they can be referred to pediatric cardiology and have uh, an implant put in which will um, stop their heart beating fast if that happens. So that's quite, quite remarkable. And there's another one that I ca uh, I've come across of Ehlers Danlos, which is a very strange thing with kind of double joints and uh, all sorts of very elastic um, joints. But that mm -hmm. can also be diagnosed with the skin, can't it? Yes, it can. Yeah. So there are, there are various types of Ehlers-Danlos. There's one where the skin is particularly uh, hyper uh, extendable. So you can basically pull a piece of skin like this and it comes out. Uh, but there's also a very important one, which is the type four one, uh, where the skin sort of appears very transparent and veins are, are much more obvious, for example, on the upper chest. And uh, those patients are at increased risk of um, an organ. So, for example, during pregnancy uh, of uh, the womb um, opening up, for example, which is can, can be very, very serious. So to to make the diagnosis is important. So dermatologists, absolutely your best friends. They can they're brilliant, brilliant at diagnosing things. Um, let, let me go uh, back to, to Carol. Um, sometimes it's difficult yeah. I know, to persuade people that will persuade doctors that uh, of a genetic test because some that you know we have a lot of very distinguished people on this uh, webinar but there are lots of uh, doctors who don't know much about uh, genomics what was your experience there and that of your wider family um well I suppose it was quite easy for me because when I first spoke to the GP and explained what was going on with my sister, she didn't hesitate to refer me. And that was before my sister had the actual diagnosis, but she set the ball in train. Um, and once we got the coordinates of my sister Jane's diagnosis, it then was quite easy for me to be tested and eventually for my brother and um, nephew and my sons. Uh, the process takes a while and cousins have been tested as a result of getting my coordinates. So I think GPs are very helpful once they know that there's a reason for it, then, you know, there's no problem there. But the problem will be for people who haven't had a family member as seriously ill as my sister. Had I been the first one, we might not know now because none of my consultants had heard of Berthog Dubé um, when I was diagnosed. Um, and so, I, uh, so Adele, <laughs> how do we overcome that? Um, so I think in dermatology, 
I can give examples from der dermatology. We're trying, we're trying quite hard. So uh, through um, our dermatology organization, the BAD, um, we're trying to uh, spread uh, the knowledge about uh, Genomics England and uh, the directory of testing and uh, that there are panels available, you know, so you can do testing for ichthyosis, for palmoplantar keratodermas, for pustular psoriasis, for disorders that affect the hair, teeth and nails, uh, for disorders associated with skin bumps like uh, Carol has, um, etc. We, we also have to try and influence the uh, dermatologists of the future. So uh, to include genomics in the curriculum so that, um, you know, dermatologists have to learn about it. Uh, and also, um, Neil and I have been involved in organizing a course uh, at the Sanger Institute called Genomics for Dermatologists. And I think that has been important as well in, in um, helping uh, dermatology trainees uh, learn more about genetic testing. Neil, I'm going to bring you back in uh, again here because I know this is something that you're absolutely passionate about. What are your thoughts? How, what would you advise patients, first of all, to if they're getting a bit of a, a problem trying to get a genetic diagnosis? So, um, Vivian, I think we recognise, as, as Stefan said, you know, it's, it's about connecting the person to the super specialist um, in some of these areas. And sometimes in those first steps of, of triage, there is this challenge of, of, of the lack of a diagnosis. Um, and I think where, in the context of skin, um, dermatologists are good, um, is that they recognize when something is rare and they know what it is, but they also recognize when they've seen something rare and it's a thing, but they don't know what it is. And where dermatology is strong is we frequently have regional meetings, for example, to look at cases and bring our collective minds together to then say, who's the best person in the country to go and see about this condition? And so in Newcastle, we will see patients at times and we'll say, this person really needs to be seen by Adele, for example. Um, and this sort of uh, network is facilitated by the British Association of Dermatologists and I think is a strength of our specialty. Um, the other aspect is um, this space of improving access to information in dermatology for patients with conditions like bird hawk duvet. And I've been fortunate to work with the Myroblitis Trust, for example, to co-produce a patient information leaflet on bird hawk duvet syndrome, which is now hosted on the British Association of Dermatologists website. And the beauty of this is, A, it's um, an accessible piece of information that's succinct, written in partnership with patients who've got a lived experience of bird hog duvet, but B, it's also something people can point at um, and, and show a QR code on their phone when they're trying to make the case to someone in, say, primary care, look, I think I might have this condition, um, and it's a very accessible, you know, piece of information. So, um, there are a number of things that we can continue to do to increase awareness and to reduce the friction points for patients with rare disease to get their answer. But there are already in place really good networks. And I think it's about getting through to um, a dermatologist who is able to then say, look, hands up, I don't know what this may be, but I know someone who might do. And then that is how we get the ball rolling sometimes. And actually, we, we shouldn't, you know, beat doctors up with a stick too much uh, for saying they don't know. <clears throat> It, actually, it's in some ways we, we don't expect doctors to know all those thousands of, of rare diseases. But what we do hope that they'll think is, oh, this is unusual. This is a rare disease. I need to send it to somebody who specializes in in rare disease. And, and if I may, I mean, this is where the rare disease collaborative networks that Stefan just mentioned are, are key, because we recognize that unless we have a sign up saying, if you have something in this space, it's unlikely that you know people will think, oh yes, I've, I've, someone's mentioned this at a meeting or this is a resource we can connect to. But Stefan, maybe you could say more about your experience of how that's drawn in new diagnoses. 
Yeah, so these things, they're called RDCNs for short, because rare, Dis rare disease collaborative network is a bit of a mouthful. But the RDCNs were set up, and there are an increase in the last count, there are eight, there might be more of them, and they've all got a special niche. And the one that I said I'm interested is, is for melunium thorax. It's, they're set up by NHS England, but they're actually for the whole UK. So there are hubs for ours in Scotland and Cambridge. And the whole point is to improve equity of access to healthcare. So it shouldn't matter if you have your rare skin disease and a bit of a pneumothoraces and you live down the road from me in Cambridge, or you happen to live in rural Wales, it shouldn't matter. And so what we do, for example, with our RDCN is we have online MDTs, multidisciplinary team meetings that happen every other month. And people from around the country, dial, dot people, doctors, I mean, it's not it's not just open to everybody, but doctors will say, I've got this case, I don't know what's wrong with them. They've got these pneumothoraces and these skin places. We can discuss them and they'll actually have a national discussion with geneticists, radiologists, respiratory doctors, whole host of other people who can then recommend to the local doctor what, whether they can just do the genetic test themselves, because many of these tests can be detect, can be requested by the doctor, it doesn't have to go to the clinical genetic service, or if we're not sure, they'll say refer into the, the, lo the local genetic service. So the idea of having these, these networks is that you don't have to wait six months to come and see you and then travel halfway across the country when your doctor could just dial in next month on the line. Um, so, 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 so that's the first thing. The second thing is, as you said, making these things making these things knowledgeable. The, the Myelovitis Trust has some cracking videos um, online, and some of the patients who come to see said they'd see me first on the video. Um, uh, and, and finally, is is the research that places like Myelovitis Trust are are um, supporting. One study that they're doing with us is to develop artificial intelligence pro pro software that runs in the background of scanners. And the idea is that if you're in the middle of somewhere that doesn't have a super specialist, hopefully in the future, your scanner will be able to flag up that that CT scan looks a little bit like Berthold de Bay. And that's research that Myrovitis Trust has just funded. Um, Carol, is this all music to your ears? <laughs> uh, yes, I, I think genetics is the way forward after what's happened um, for me and my family. And advertising it and getting it out there I think is terribly important and the fact that the skin is a window to a lot of these conditions I find extraordinary really so somehow or the other the whole medical profession has um I think has well, to take should... some sort of a lead from the dermatology yeah. department. Well they should be putting dermatologists up yes on yes <laughs> <laughs> where should we get their shine Adele um, yeah, just to give a little shout out for other support groups that support uh, patients with skin diseases. So, for example, the ichthyosis support group uh, supports patients with ichthyosis throughout the UK. Uh, the Ectodermal Dysplasia Society supports patients with ectodermal dysplasia. And uh, Pakinikia Project, which is actually based in the United States, but provides support to patients worldwide uh, with uh, Pakinikia congenita. And the, those societies can also play an important part, uh, as the uh, Myrovitis Trust has done, in signposting uh, people to, to experts and genetic testing. Well, I'm delighted to say we're getting some questions. <laughs> so um, thank you so, for persisting. Once again, it's Vivian with B-I-E-N-N-E, -E, uh, vivian.parry at genomicsengland.co.uk. And the first question we've got is from a BHD patient, and I suspect this is one for Neil. This person would love to understand why fibrofolliculomas increase with age and curious about the changes within the cellular makeup of skin in people with BHD. Neil, this is music to your ears isn't it this no, is your, uh, this absolutely theory. and um i'll i'll try to rein it in a little bit everyone um but, <laughs> but in, in i essence... may not succeed in <laughs> it, by the way so so actually um this is exactly what uh, the myra of lightest trust have, have helped uh fund in my group to help better understand and what we think um is interesting in a number of genetic conditions where you have multiple tumors forming in the skin and in other tissues is that they are often 
when you look at the DNA of those individuals, in people who have one working copy of the culprit piece of, of DNA, if you like, and one copy that is not working. And in the actual um, tissue where you see the condition, say in, in the kidney tumor, both of the um, uh, copies when you test it are the ones that no longer work. And, and we think this mechanism, <clears throat> what's known as a, a two-hit hypothesis, must be happening in other tissues like the skin. And, and currently we're trying to hunt down the relevant cell in the skin that results in these skin bumps forming around hair follicles. And so um, watch this space uh, because it, it's a really um, exciting time in terms of narrowing down um, single cells in the skin using technologies that we're increasingly able to access following projects such as the Human Cell Atlas, where we now know in the skin um, across all those layers, um, there are more than say 34 different cell types sitting there, different types of immune cells, different types of blood vessels, different types of cells that you know make us sweat, for example. Um, and across these different cell types, we're seeking to find out which um, cell might be the ones in which a second hit happens that drives the formation of these fibrofolliculomas and trichodiscomas. I briefly want to apologize for all the Latin that we're using this evening, um, because sometimes <laughs> that can be um, slightly uh, uh, a problem in terms of accessibility. And just to, to explain what those two terms are briefly, in the skin, we, we recognize when we look at samples of these skin tumors under a microscope, patterns which pathologists have um, seen to either focus around a hair follicle, and these are the fibrofolliculomas, um, or patterns where we see hair follicles displaced with a disc of abnormal um, collagen and, and other proteins in the skin being deposited in the center, and those are trichodiscomas. And really, these are not dangerous in their own right, but are an indication of some of these conditions when you see them in um, multiplicity, as you do in patients with Berthog Dubé. So, so I hope that is a um, attempt at an answer at that point. And what about the thing about age? So what we know in these conditions where you already carry one change um, in a uh, piece of DNA that's important in a condition uh, is that as we get wiser, um, we increasingly accumulate um, small errors in our DNA as it's copied over. And as a result of this, the remaining working copy can sometimes be affected in the skin. The other element is obviously the environmental impact in skin conditions. So the longer we've been out walking down sunny streets or otherwise, um, even up here in Newcastle, we end up getting little changes in our DNA as little um, sequences that change from being the normal um, sequence, if you like, to ones that result in reduced function of the remaining working copy of a piece of DNA. And that's just how many years you spend, say, in a sunny place, for example, uh, and so some things like that can impact and cause certain skin genetic conditions like the one we've been speaking about today, Berthog Dubé, but also in conditions like tuberous sclerosis complex, um, where we see second hits in these skin cells that cause these lumps to form. And, and this is just a function of time. Uh, we have a question from Mathieu in France. Uh, bienvenue, uh, Mathieu. Oh, um, <laughs> So um, he says, uh, me, my mother and two brothers all have BHD. Uh, relating to skin, we all have lipoma. I read that it's related to BHD. Do you have any comment? Who wants to take that? But is that one for you, Neil? So um, I'm happy to start. And if others want to add, absolutely. So we, we've seen a, a number of families um, where we see two conditions presenting in the same person. And, and sometimes it's... Um, possible to link all of that together with one genetic change. But the, increasingly, as we look at whole genomes, to come back to what we were speaking at, about at the beginning, we now know that there can be second pieces of DNA in some pieces of family, in, in some families that account for the second set of, of patterns that we see. And, and really, having looked at the literature for patients with, with berthog dubé syndrome, the co-presentation of multiple lipomas is, is not a, a frequent pattern. Um, however, separately, I also see some patients who have multiple lipomas alone as, as a, a 
you know, a phenotype in the skin. And, and it may be that in this particular family, we could have two pieces of DNA that are showing up in different ways in the skin. And, and it may not necessarily all be linked um, to, to one culprit piece of DNA. So there may be a few explanations, but this is the sort of thing where careful family history, careful clinical examination of different people to see how patterns segregate in different individuals and how genetic changes go with that can teach us a lot. And that's a fascinating thing about changes in genes is that, you know, two people can have exactly the same change in their DNA, but only one of them will have symptoms or they'll have completely different symptoms. And that's why it's, you know, so difficult, so fascinating and so rewarding to have a look at them and to try and, you know, constantly match the phenotype so what the actual appearance of the skin and the the, the genotype um adele i think this one might be for you is uh how do people because we've talked a lot about these uh these kind of lumps in vhd they're not um dangerous in and of themselves but people do have them re removed what's the treatment for that kind of thing adele yeah. Yeah, so so people can have them removed in very various ways. If they're very small, they can be uh, possibly hyphrocated off or burnt off very gently. Um, if they're bigger, they might be scraped off. Because those uh, small tumors aren't malignant, um, then obviously we don't want to do anything too invasive. So we don't want to be making a big cut and leave, leaving a scar, which is worse than what was there. And in, in, in many cases, if it's not bothering the person, I would leave, leave them alone, to be honest. So, Stefan, if somebody has these uh, fibrofolliculomas, should they also be thinking about having monitoring or, for, or regular scans? It's a, for, the, for the kidneys or for the lungs? Uh, for the well, lung, either. For the lungs, no. Um, and the reason I say that is because when these patients suffer from pneumothorax, now I know Carol had a, had a torrid time, but generally the pneumothorax is annoying. It isn't life threatening. Generally, let me just very generally. Um, so we don't think the risk of repeated um, um, CT scans because a chest X-ray won't be useful. Um, it's useful for the person to know that they might be a risk of pneumothorax. So let's say Neil diagnoses somebody with Bert Holter Bay, they should know that they're at risk of developing um, cystic lung disease and pneumothoraces. But I wouldn't necessarily recommend them putting them through the scanner for interest sake, because we know 90% of them will have lung cysts. Um, only half of them will have a pneumothorax. So I, I always say to medical students is that only do a test if it's gonna change what you do. So the genetic tests change what they do. This person is going to have lifelong monitoring. Doing a CT scan to find out somebody has got lung cysts isn't actually going to change what I do. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, there is a paper coming out very soon um, where we're giving some guidance um, about, di uh, about diving. So people can't go scuba diving if they've had a pneumothorax. The evidence is really not there to, to give a very clear answer for Bert Hogg de Bay syndrome. If that ever shows that diving is unsafe in Bert Hogg Bay, we can then change that guidance. But for at the moment, it will be doing a test for the sake of it. Now, we've got quite a number of questions that are coming actually from all over the world. So we are going global. <laughs> so there's somebody saying that genetic test results can affect cost and availability of life insurance, long term care insurance. So family members who have the option of delaying testing might want to arrange these before getting tested when possible. So uh, actually, the situation is rather different in the UK because um, we have the NHS and uh, there is you, you do not have to say that you've had uh, genetic testing. Although, of course, once you've started having treatment for a particular condition, then you do have to report that to your insurer. But, but um, yes, it, it's, a, it's a different situation in other countries. Um, this is an interesting one, which I'd be very interested what Adele says. And this is from Hanya Kamar Khan. Uh, I'm not sure um, where she's from. She's saying, what limitations do lack of genetic testing bring um, in treatment for genodermatoses? 
considering belonging uh, to a country where maximum patients we get are from marginalized populations not being able to afford genetic testing. So Adele, what would your thoughts be? So to, to be honest, at the moment, not a whole lot, because for most genetic skin diseases, there is no treatment that works anyway. Uh, so treat, treatment is symptomatic. Uh, you know, there are there are a couple of extraordinary examples, uh, like um, some of the examples I, I gave earlier. Uh, but in general, um, being in a country in like a, a developing country, for example, for, where there isn't gen genetic testing available, probably isn't going to affect you very much if you have ichthyosis or palmoplantar keratoderma. Um, however, I guess as more tree treatments become available, uh, then for a period, those treatments are going to probably be expensive. So for example, if there's some new cream for ichthyosis for a specific gene to replace it, that cream is going to be very expensive in the beginning, but with time it may become uh, cheaper. And we also need to think about the cost of genetic testing. So the cost of genetic testing is coming down all the time. And it surprises me actually often in, in uh, countries where there isn't, um, or where I perceive there isn't a lot of uh, money, genetic testing is, 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 is being performed. So, so I think there is hope that, uh, you know, genetic testing will become more uh, widely available. And the other thing that we should say here is that uh, a lot of the genetic databases are based primarily on people from northern European or um, US uh, uh, regions, and they mm -hmm. don't reflect global population. And particularly people who come from the Sahel, which is that middle region of Africa, who have the most extraordinarily diverse genomes of uh, anyone on the, on the planet. We really don't know enough to be able to diagnose as effectively as, uh, as we would like. Um, there's a very interesting question, which is here for, for you, Stefan, I think. Um, uh, is BHD regressive? There is four generations in my family who have or probably have BHD. Paternal grandfather, mother, her sister, myself, one of my brothers, and 50% of uh, uh, our children. Down to my generation, all had spontaneous pneumothorax, but only for my generation down have had genetic testing. My mother, aunt, brother, and I have had to endure pleurectomies and pleuro... I don't know Pleuresis. what the word is. Yeah, that's the word. Um, I'm interested to know this as I have eight grandchildren and my brother has four. I'm aware that the likelihood of it being passed down is 50 50. Yeah. So really good question. Is it progressive? If you'd asked me five years ago, I would have said the lung disease. No, but keep but keep a close eye on the kidneys. Absolutely. Keep an eye on the kidneys. The most important thing is to get renal renal surveillance, um, because that's the thing that we know saves lives. With the lung disease, most people will never know that they've got lung cysts, except if they've had pneumothoraces. And some families, the pneumothorax seems to be a bigger feature of Berthold de than others. So this is what we're saying is you can have the same genetic defect and put it in a different what's called a genetic background. So your family may be different to another family and it may manifest slightly in that family more strongly as pneumothorax. There is some emerging evidence, and I'm only talking over the last three or four years, that in some older patients, there is a progressive a progressive change in the cysts. It is far from certain. Well, no, it certainly happens in a small number of people, but it's not such a dramatic thing that we currently are monitoring. But certainly watch this space. It's something that we are aware of a small number of patients. Their cysts can get um, get more, more um, can get more plentiful, but usually much later in life. Uh, another quick fire question for you. I was recently diagnosed with BHD after an incidental dermatology finding. Hooray for the dermatologist. I've never knowingly had lung or kidney problems and no one in my family has been diagnosed, though my father has the bumps. Yes. Generally, is air travel high risk? No. So, so there's a one there's one paper that linked lung cysts with causing pneumothorax, but it's generally accepted that the risk of 
air travel with any cystic lung disease is quite low. The issue, however, is if you've got a small pneumothorax, then air travel is unsafe because when you go into a plane, the pressure drops. And so a small pneumothorax gets bigger. So if this person feels they've got a bit of chest pain and they've had a pneumothorax, the safe thing to do is to get a chest X-ray, because if the chest X-ray is normal, they're OK to fly. Um, but but it is not there's very little strong evidence that flying causes the pneumothorax. It makes an existing one worse. Hi, Carol, you're smiling there. <laughs> is this, is this something that is a, a, a common question in your family? Um, no, not really, because um, my aunt had each of her lungs spontaneously collapsed in her 20s. She passed away a couple of years ago at 84. And since then, I'm the only one that we're, I'm aware of. So, no, it isn't really discussed because it, it is extress, extremely rare anyway, isn't it? Yeah. So the um, pneumothoraces happen in about half of patients with it, but it isn't the flying cause it. I, no, would, no. I, would, I, would, I would always advise, one thing I always remember to do, though, is if a patient's had a pneumothorax, always tell your travel insurer. And your travel insurer will add a tiny bit to your premium but um, it's it's it makes you bulletproof because if you then go on holiday and through bad luck you have your extra pneumothorax overseas, not because the flights caused it, just because of bad luck. If you haven't told your travel insurer, you might not get anything. <laughs> Whereas if you've told them beforehand and they've added the one pound to your your, then you're bulletproof. And we're always hoping, Stefan, that something like that happens and the cry goes out on the aeroplane: Is there a doctor in the house? that you're the doctor in that's in the house. <laughs> that's happened once. It's, yes. very, it's very stressful. I, I did have a, a, an air stewardess come up to me and uh, she said uh, to the person uh, who's sitting next to me, she said, I see that you're a doctor, sir, and we do have a problem at the back. Could you come and help? And the person sitting next to me said, only if they're rusting, I'm a doctor of metallurgy. <laughs> No, we've and, and uh, one final thing because I slightly mi re misrepresented one of those questions. Can um, somebody's asking? Can the HD uh, peter out? In other words, is it something that will always be transmitted from generation to generation to generation, or might it just peter out? There's a fifty percent. Well, it has in Carol's family. There's a fifty percent. In my immediate. Yeah. There's only a fifty percent chance of transmitting it. So it's 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 the numbers. If if your children have not inherited the gene, they uh, then they will not have it. But at the moment, there are no therapies. I mean, this may come, but there are no gene corrective therapies for for Bert Hogg to Bay. But 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 if your children doesn't don't don't, don't um, inherit the gene, then it's it's finished in that line. And I think to add, Stefan, I think this is where, you know, knowing your genetic test status can be really helpful in terms of family planning and generations downstream for some for some families. Because um, I guess if there is a, a pattern seen in the skin or a phenotype of skin bumps, then one could you know, already start to get an indication. But I think this is, to me, another reason um, in terms of the patients I look after um, where when we have a genetic diagnosis, this informs how some families choose to either um, go down the route of, of you know, starting their family, uh, or sometimes they have additional options that they might want to consider before doing that if they know the change in their family. Brilliant. So thank you. We've reached the end of our time and uh, it's been absolutely terrific. Um, so thank you, Adela, to Stefan Martiniak. Uh, Neil Rajan and Carol Cox, um, superstar, thank you so much for telling us about your uh, experience. And the things I think to come away with, genetic testing, incredibly important and absolutely part of modern dermatology. And the other thing is, if you are ever asked when you have been uh, given a genetic test, if you would put your data in for research, please always say yes because actually saying yes means that more research can be done on these very, very rare skin conditions. And uh, hooray for dermatologists, as I said before, because they do have these extraordinary superpowers and are able to diagnose so much with the skin being this advertising hoarding 
for what's going on inside of the body as well as on the outside of the body. Thank you all so much. And thank you to the Mara of Blighters Trust and uh, all of you who've been on this uh, call with us. Bye for now. Bye. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye-bye.